Operation Neptune, commonly called Overlord or D-Day, is one of the boldest amphibious invasions ever conducted, but while the story of the soldiers, airmen, and paratroopers often takes center stage, the naval component is equally fascinating. It was a massive armada, one of the largest assembled in military history, with perhaps one vessel standing out the USS Nevada, yet somehow, despite its miraculous history, this ship ended up at the bottom of the sea after being used for target practice. Today we discover its history and legacy. I'm your host Ryan Sokash and you're watching It's History. The USS Nevada was as large as ships came when she was built. Launched in July of 1914, she was a mighty and one-of-a-kind ship, with a displacement of 27,500 tons, a modern all-or-nothing armor scheme to protect only the most crucial parts of the boat, making it light. The ship also had 10 14-inch rifles and 4 turrets. And yes, I called her one-of-a-kind, although she did have a sister ship, Oklahoma. With the distinction being that the Nevada used the most modern steam turbine engines, while the Oklahoma used the traditional triple expansion engines. The finite differences aren't necessary for understanding the two ships, though as a consequence of the designs, compromises were made. Both could travel at 21 knots, but because of the engine difference, Nevada could sustain that speed for much longer and have a smoother ride. During World War I, the two served as crucial neutrality patrol and later convoy escort ships, but when the United States eventually declared war against the Triple Alliance, they and the other active American battleships in the Atlantic joined the Grand Fleet. They worked to deter the German Navy from running the North Sea Blockade, where they would face certain destruction against the combined weight of the French, British, and American navies. Between the two wars, Nevada and the Oklahoma would sail from the US Pacific coast to New Zealand and Australia, a move that alerted the Japanese that ultimately there was no distance American warships couldn't cross. Around this time, the Nevada was again modernized, removing her cage masts and placing tripod masts with better long-range detection changing the bridge superstructure and adding even more AA guns. She moved to the new Pacific Fleet headquarters to Pearl Harbor when things were finished. Nevada and Oklahoma would remain at Pearl Harbor, rotating through fleet problems and escalating series of war games held by the Navy to prepare for the next large-scale war. These exercises prepared the fleet for both Pacific and Atlantic war. Even without enemy fire, the results of these war games left a significant impact on the captains, crew, and ranking officers of the fleet. But if you've heard of the USS Nevada before, it wasn't because of those scarcely recorded fleet problems. It was because of what would happen later on the day that would haunt the US Navy forever. Before I go further, I should preface this all by saying that our friends Indy and Idell and Time Ghost have already made an incredible minute by minute, five hour long documentary on the events of D-Day. It is the most comprehensive documentary and I cannot recommend watching it enough. Plus, I took part in co-hosting some segments on location in France. So definitely check that out. And now let's get back to the Nevada. On the morning of December the 7th, Nevada moored along at the front of Battleship Row, with most ranking officers shoreside either to be with their family or simply because the shipboard beds weren't as comfortable. Well, this was true of many ships, so much of Nevada's officer corps was shoreside that the officer on duty that morning was the damage control officer, Francis Thomas. His cool-headed command from the deeply armored central station and eventually from the bridge and the conning tower would be crucial for what would happen next. Meanwhile, the officer on deck was Joseph Talsik Jr. His regular duties were, ironically enough, the anti-aircraft commander. Perhaps with some insight into previous naval exercises involving air raids at port or knowledge of the British invasion at Taranto, Italy, he was constantly concerned about air attacks on the ship while at anchor. Usually, each battleship would have only one of its boilers operating to provide primary power, while any additional need would be fed to the ship from Fort Island shore. 
This wouldn't be enough power to get them moving under their own steam, but on Nevada, and her alone, Joseph had given an order, before the attack began, to light a second boiler. This gave the mighty Dreadnought just enough power to get in motion and attempt to flee the attack or haunt the enemy fleet. Nevada, leaving her mooring lines and getting underway to sea, created a massive morale boost for the sailors and marines defending the other ships, but her escape would not be so easy. Seeing the battleship in motion, Japanese pilots immediately made her the primary target, shifting their focus from her sister burning in battleship row. While underway, she would take hit after hit by Japanese level and dive bombers, taking shots to her midship, focal, and fuel tanks. She was nearly hit in her 14-inch magazines like her sister Arizona, still fortunately enough they were empty anyway due to be replaced with a more modern, longer range shell later that very same day. That didn't happen. Thomas realized she was about to be sunk and had her eventually grounded at Hospital Point, only anchored safely by the heroism of Edward Hill, who manually set the anchors free at the cost of his own life by Japanese strafing. By the end of the attack, Nevada had been struck so often that her hull was too damaged for the Navy to even estimate how many bombs hit her, if not for visual recollection. Her sister, Oklahoma, was struck by almost a dozen torpedoes and capsized entirely. Now, the salvaging of Nevada from Hospital Point is worthy of a video in its own right. However, for brevity, the process required weeks of skilled steel, wooden, and concrete patching done almost entirely underwater by divers and equipment that could be best described as suboptimal. One patch that the salvage effort had to make spanned several compartments, from the keel to the main deck, and to make it more difficult, it had to be wooden since there wasn't enough steel. To add insult to injury, however, once all the patchwork was done, it had to be removed, because upon second measurement, they realized it would have prevented Nevada from entering even the harbor's deepest dry dock. The entire process lasted weeks, but eventually, she was laid down in the dry dock in late February and patched as quickly as possible. From there, she was sent off to Puget Sound Navy Yard for two months of detailed repairs and well-needed modernization, including adding as many anti-aircraft guns onto the decks as they could possibly fit. As a cherry on top, the Nevada was also fitted with a significantly improved SK-2 anti-air radar. Nevada would serve convoy escort and shore patrol duties for most of the war, deterring the surface elements of the Kriegsmarine from taking to the sea, just as she did in the Great War. It was quiet work, but all that quiet ended on the morning of June the 6th, 1944. From the fog of the English Channel, USS Nevada took her station at 2.30 and began her massive preliminary bombardment just after 5.45. Under the command of Rear Admiral Mortendeo, Nevada would continuously pound away at the German bunkers of Utah Beach, even correcting her aim when the American forces realized that they'd landed at the wrong beachhead. But a more tactical, subtle one. Nevada's primary task was destroying artillery pieces, bunkers, and most importantly, a 12-foot concrete seawall installed by German engineers to repel infantry and tanks. After a preliminary bombardment to eliminate enemy elements called in by the Army Airborne already in combat, she set to work on coastal fortifications. Whenever guns on the shore attempted to deter or target the Super Dreadnought, she answered with overwhelming volleys of 14-inch armor-piercing shells. One by one, the artillery positions were straddled, shocked, and eventually destroyed. Eventually, any threat to the ship and infantry was dealt with. Nevada and her cruiser escorts targeted the concrete seawall. With help from the 4th Infantry Division's combat engineers, several hulls were successfully blasted through, and the American Army overran the German and conscript garrison in brutal close-quarter fighting. In Normandy, we were at general quarters for 80 hours non-stop, recalls Richard Ramsey, then a 20-year-old gunner's mate, who went on to explain, quote, we had the honor of firing the first round at the Germans. At the same time, there was Seaman Jay Gibbon, who loaded the 5-inch guns 
and after each salvo would hold up one hand, which the crew interpreted as a signal to reload and fire. But that wasn't exactly the case. Given had jammed his hand between one of the shells and his propellant charge, causing one of his fingers to break severely, almost being severed. He continued loading and feeding the gun for over two hours before the crew officer realized what the signal really meant and sent him to medical, rapidly replacing him with another loader. He had loaded over 30 tons of ammunition with a broken finger and wasn't heard complaining even once. For 80 hours, the crew ate on deck, slept in short stints from the firing, and supported the 4th, 82nd, and 101st Divisions with precise, overwhelming gunfire, destroying bunkers, field guns, and two different panzer platoons either attacking the beach or the Screaming Eagles. She returned to Britain for ammo and did it all over again in the battle for Cherbourg. In those ever-valuable first days of the invasion, Nevada secured success time and again. Nevada's career would take her to new heights, not even the most fast battleships could reach. She fought in six major campaigns in World War II. In fact, after her repairs, she was part of the fleet tasked with recapturing the Aleutian Islands, the Atlantic convoy escorts, Operation Overlord, and the invasion of southern France. She would also go on to join the American Pacific invasions. And while she wasn't the only American battleship participating in Operation Neptune, she was the only one at Pearl Harbor on that infamous Sunday morning. Unfortunately, the good times quickly came to an end after capitulation of Japan. After the bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, the American military and government members advocated for increased testing and demonstrations of the power of the American nuclear bomb, resulting in Operation Crossroads in July of 1946, when 95 Super Plus warships were assembled and lined with other surplus equipment including trucks, tanks, and aircraft. The former Japanese flagship Nagato, a German heavy cruiser, and the American battleship Nevada were among the 95 fated ships. Nevada, the target for the airdrop test, Abel, was painted in bright orange to be evident from the B-29's bomb site. However, even by an unadjusted sight or just bad luck, Nevada was missed entirely, and the bomb detonated just overhead a Navy auxiliary. Despite the bomb being of identical composition as the one that fell on Nagasaki, with a yield of 20 kilotons of dynamite, most other ships were undamaged, with most radiation being mitigated and dispersed within a day, and samples were taken from her and other vessels. A second test, Baker, on July the 25th, tested an identical bomb in an underwater mine configuration. The damage difference was staggering, as a mile-tall water column shot into the sky from the site, reaching at least half a mile in width. However, only eight ships sank and eight more were damaged. Nevada, radioactive, heavily damaged, and 32 years old, refused to die. In what was likely unbelievable to many witnesses, she defied death even when no one was on board to provide damage control. Unwilling to leave her there, the US Navy towed her back to Hawaii, where Iowa's modern battleship used her one last time for target practice, unleashing volley after volley against the old crippled warship. Even the mighty 16-inch guns of America's last great battleship class couldn't finish that dreadnought off. Iowa departed for Pearl Harbor as air-released torpedoes finished the ship off. And so it was. She sank 65 miles off the Hawaiian coast on the 25th of July. She remained hidden for decades, old, alone, and abandoned by her country. The old dreadnought was worked to the bone, written off, and used as target. Yet she remained defiant, even in death, found upside down, but intact in 2020 by the Ocean Infinity Program, whose mission was to rediscover America's lost warships. And even here, one more almost poetic irony remains for she wasn't entirely alone at the bottom of the ocean. I previously left off talking about her sister after her sinking at Pearl Harbor, but that wasn't the end of her saga. Oklahoma was known to be beyond repair from day one of salvage. Still, after all the other wounded giants were repaired and sailed away to war, Oklahoma could finally be raised, patched, 
and taken to the continent. At least, the Navy assumed they could scrap her for her parts for the remaining fleet. Fate intervened while she was being towed away, however. As the tugs came while they were 500 miles off Oahu, with Oklahoma's weight slowly increasing as the water went through the temporary patches in her hull, the tugs were at serious risk of being dragged under by the dreadnought. Both were collecting water on their fan decks, so they cut the lines and saved themselves. Oklahoma, however, was lost at sea on May the 17th, 1947, joining her sister at the bottom. Perhaps fate decided that the two ships had suffered enough and deserved to go in peace to the bottom rather than take the indignity of being scrapped and turned into lunch trays. In spirit, the two sister ships still sail together, guarding Hawaii from its north and south. And that'll do it for today, but special thanks to our YouTube channel members for sponsoring this video. To find out how you can also become a part of our community, click that join button or check out the link in the description. Until next time, this is Ryan Sokash, signing off.